Welcome to Sword of the Spirit, written and presented by Colin Dye, Senior Minister of Kensington Temple and leader of London City Church. Sword of the Spirit is a dynamic teaching series equipping the believers of today to build the disciples of tomorrow. We pray that you find these programs inspiring and a catalyst in deepening your knowledge of God, your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, and your intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Hello and welcome to the Sword of the Spirit, a school of ministry in the Word and the Spirit. Our theme is Knowing the Son, and we've been looking at the unique person of Jesus Christ, fully God and fully man the eternal Son of the eternal God being made man, God and man in one person. We've seen how this uniqueness of Jesus is reflected not just in his being, but also in his mission. We see that Jesus Christ came with a unique mission. There was a time when Jesus was given the Bible to read in his own local synagogue in Nazareth. And he turned to the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel and to demonstrate the kingdom of God. And it's this twin aspect of the gospel, both the gospel of word and the gospel of deed and power that Jesus so fully and uniquely demonstrates. When Jesus spoke about the kingdom of God, he didn't just speak, he also demonstrated the kingdom. This is how we understand the signs and wonders of Jesus with both these aspects, his words and his deeds. The idea of this is highlighted in Luke chapter 8 and verse 1, which describes Jesus as preaching and bringing glad tidings. Now it came to pass afterward that he went through every city and village preaching and bringing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God, and the twelve were with him. Now, what does this mean? There are two verbs used, keruson, proclaiming, heralding, and euangelizmenos, meaning evangelizing or bringing good tidings. Now, verses 2 to verse 56 in Luke 8 go on to illustrate what verse, verse 1 means, because it shows what Jesus' mission included. So when it says preaching and evangelizing, heralding the gospel, proclaiming the gospel, and evangelizing, this is what it means. So if you want to know what it means to go and preach the gospel and evangelize, here it is. Preaching and answering questions, verses 4 to 18. Bringing peace, verses 22 to 25. Liberating captives, verses 26 to 39. Healing the sick, Verses 43 to 48, raising the dead, verses 49 to 56. Let's start that and see how far we get, because that's preaching and evangelizing. It's the same with the other Gospels. In Mark, for example, he begins his account by describing uh, one day in the life of Jesus. Verses 21 to 34 show that a typical day in Jesus' ministry is... He preaches in the synagogue, verses 21 to 22. He delivers a captive, verses 23 to 26. He heals the sick, verses 29, 31, and 34. He casts out demons, preaching, delivering, healing, casting out demons. Preaching, healing, delivering, casting out demons. That's an average day. That's what you, you know, a plumber gets up in the morning, goes out, plums his house, comes back again. This is what Jesus is. Got up, went out, preached, healed, delivered. Preached, healed, delivered. That's the ministry of Jesus. That's his mission. In the gospel, in every one of them, we see Jesus ministering to large crowds, but also small groups of people, one-on-one -on -one encounters, touching people at their point in need. But the mission of Jesus was always multifaceted. The people of his day would have been aware of many, many different things, but three things they saw him do above everything else. They saw him release people from the grip of evil, he saw them heal their diseases, and he saw them teach about God's kingdom. And all of these three things, preaching, healing, and delivering, he was showing them the love and the glory of the living God. So, number one, the sun breaks evil power. In the rule of God, in that seminar, we're teaching on the righteousness of God, how it's arrived in the person of Jesus Christ. Now, everything 
that uh, Jesus did by way of victory over the enemy was achieved at the cross. That's true. But there were many early rounds in this battle that were won by Jesus by his perfect submission to the Father throughout all of his life and in his mighty works which demonstrated his unique authority, the presence of the kingdom and the destruction of the enemy's kingdom. As soon as Jesus was born, Satan recognized him as a future conqueror and so he tried to defeat him from the very beginning. He attacked Jesus through the slaughter of the Bethlehem children. He attacked Jesus in the wilderness temptations. He attacked Jesus through the Nazareth's congregation's attempt on his life. The crowd's desire to make him a political ruler, that was an attack upon Jesus. You come and be this kind of a ruler. You want to rule, we'll show you how. No, that's the devil's way. I'm not saying the, devil, the devil's way is politics. I'm not saying politics is of the devil. But I'm saying the kingdom of God does not come by politics. The kingdom of God comes by the rule and the reign of God in people's lives. Satan opposed Jesus through Peter. No, no, Lord, you're not to go to the cross. Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. You're not talking now from God. You're speaking from the devil. You're, you're, you're thinking humanly. The devil attacked Jesus through Judas' betrayal. It was Satan that entered Judas' heart. How ironic that the very thing that Satan instigated was God's plan all along that would destroy the devil. Isn't that wonderful? The devil's a loser. The devil's a loser. The very thing the devil plans against you, and if God allows it, it's the very thing that God has ordered that you would destroy the devil in your life. Somebody shout hallelujah. <laughs> I know, I know we're Bible teaching now. And not much room for hallelujah, but uh, let's, let's an occasional one le leap out. Jesus was determined, however, to fulfill what God had told him to do. Even though he had opposition from, the, from Satan. Indeed, he expected it. As he announced God's kingdom that the kingdom had come in him and through him, through his mighty works. So in the Gospels we see the kingdom of God advancing through Jesus' ministry and Satan's kingdom retreating as demons are cast out, as diseases are healed, and as nature is calmed. In the Gospels, we see in Luke particularly how Jesus sent out other disciples to announce God's kingdom by preaching, by healing, by casting out demons. And when they returned, he told them that he had seen Satan fall from heaven as a result of their activities. So when the kingdom is being advanced and the gospel is being preached and people are being healed and delivered, Satan's power is being broken. Now we understand that uh, Jesus had many struggles with Satan before the cross. One of these Struggles appears to have been reflected in, say, Mark's Gospel, chapter 3 and verse 27. He says, No one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man, and then he will plunder his house. So Jesus came to bind the strong man, which means that he came as the stronger one. But he is coming here, dealing with Satan, binding the strong man and plundering his goods. 1 John 3, verse 8. It says, for this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. He came to undo what the devil had done. The word destroy there means to unloose or undo. He came to undo what the devil had done in corrupting God's creation, especially through sin. So it was his mission to bring deliverance to humanity. Matthew 12, 28, Jesus said, if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you showing that the breaking the power of evil was at the heart of Jesus' kingdom message and manifestation. In his life, his words, his deeds, the Son broke the power of evil, and of course, this climaxed at the cross, which was the supreme act of deliverance, because at the cross, Jesus destroyed the devil. Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death 
he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So by the death of Jesus Christ, Satan's power is destroyed and we are set free. And so although the full breaking of Satan's power did not take place until the cross, we mustn't forget that Jesus lived in perfect victory before the cross and he defeated Satan on every score. That's an important part of his mission. Long before the cross, Jesus is constantly releasing people from the power of the devil. He releases the Capernaum demoniac. Peter's mother-in-law from disease, the blind and dumb demoniac, the Gadarene demoniacs, the Canaanite daughter, the epileptic demoniac, the crippled woman, the dumb demoniac. In all of the various Gospels we read of these stories. And we find some great strong statements about the Son's mission to destroy and break the power of evil. In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 4, and verse 24, it says... Then his fame went throughout all Syria and they brought to him all sick people who were afflicted with diseases and torments and those who were demon-possessed, epileptics and paralytics, and he healed them. And in these statements that speak generally about his healing and delivering ministry, we find that it's his mission to break the power of evil in the lives of enslaved men and women. Now when we examine this, we find the principles that govern Jesus' mission and his ministry. And we cover this in detail, both in ministry in the spirit and in also reaching the lost. So I won't spend much time on it now, but let's notice to begin with that he delivered people who were brought to his attention. He did that. He brought that. When people came to him, he set them free. He asked very few questions in his deliverance ministry. You don't have to start interviewing demons, friends. Just cast them out in the name of Jesus. He spoke directly to the demon. He understood the source of the demonic problem was the demonic. He, he, didn't, he didn't ignore the person, but he, he addressed the, deal, the demon, then he dealt with the person. So sometimes we're trying to deal with people when it's, when it's not flesh and blood, that's the problem. He made no distinction between sufferers, and uh, there's no distinction in the Gospels between those suffering oppression, possession, depression, if infestation, attack, affliction. Instead, the Greek uses one word, daimon idzomai. They're all demonized, and they need release. That's all he was concerned about. Whereas today, we get very clinical and analytical and say, is the demon in, upon, near? What? Listen, if it's a demon, get rid of it. As I said when I was teaching on this, many people ask the question, can a Christian have a demon? I say, well, who wants one? Can a Christian have a demon? It's like, please may I have one? My answer is yes, you may if you want one. But if you don't want one, no. And so we have to understand that this is a real spiritual battle. But in the name of Jesus Christ, we have authority. Jesus demonstrated that. We also see that Jesus distinguished casting out of demons from healing, which means that not all sickness is a demon. He relied on the Holy Spirit in his ministry. We also see he terrified demons. That's a comforting thought, isn't it? Jesus terrified demons, and so do you if Jesus is in you. Don't be terrified of demons. Demons are terrified of you. Also, it shows that this ministry impressed people. It was a sign and a wonder, and they were awestruck at the greatness of God when they saw him with a word cast out demons. They said, what kind of teaching is this? With a word With a word of authority, he casts out demons. He speaks to the demons and they listen. They saw his authority. Then we move on to his healing ministry. Like many other facets of this unique mission, we can see his healing ministry through several different perspectives. We can think of the healing ministry as part of the Son's calling to break the power of evil. Where it says, for example, in Acts chapter 10, verse 38, Peter says, You know how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power and how he went about doing good and healing all those who were oppressed by the devil because God was with him. So Jesus' authority over disease is as much his authority over the devil as his authority over demons because ultimately sickness came into the world through sin, and so it is originally and ultimately demonic. 
It doesn't mean to say everybody who is sick is, a, is sick because they're a sinner or because they've got some demon or because the devil's operating, but the source of this is not God. And so we can see the healing ministry of Jesus as part of the, of the ministry of, of victory over Satan. But we can also think of healing as part of the Son's calling to serve needy humanity. You see, I'm following the four Gospels again. Matthew's authority, Matthew describing Jesus' authority, his kingly authority, Mark describing his, his servanthood. So we can think of healing as Jesus coming to serve a needy people, stressing that people are made whole through, self, through the self-sacrifice of his wounds and through his atoning blood as the, as the suffering servant of the Lord, the suffering son of man. We can also think of healing as part of the Son's prophetic ministry. He healed people because he was the Christ who was filled with the Spirit like the healing prophets of old, which is very much a, a theme perhaps in uh, Luke's Gospel. We also think of healing as a wonderful revelation of the Lord, a revelation of the Father's heart, Yahweh Rapha, the Lord who heals. And so uh, he was healing the sick because he was and is the healing God in action. Here's the revelation of the Father, John's Gospel. Once again, we must hold these complementary perspectives together to understand the Son's ministry and his mission in its perfect fullness. When Jesus returned to the synagogue in Nazareth to introduce himself as the one who fulfills Isaiah chapter 61 and has been anointed by the Spirit and was now therefore ready to heal the brokenhearted and give new sight to the blind, we see that from this point on that the healing of Jesus is a major focus of the Gospel writers because it's a distinguishing feature, a major feature of his mission on earth. So many people say, well, you don't have to worry too much about Jesus' healing ministry. It's not that important. It was, it's very important. It's central to his ministry. If you don't, correctly state the Son's healing ministry, you misrepresent his unique mission to the world. So what was his healing mission? We see illustrations of it throughout all of the Gospels. Let's list these healings quickly. The nobleman's son at Capernaum, Jairus' daughter, the woman with the issue of blood, two blind men, the paralyzed man let down through the roof, a leper, the centurion's servant, Peter's mother-in-law, the widow of Nain's son, the resurrection of that son, the lame man at the pool of Beth Bethesda, the man born blind, the man with the withered hand, the woman bent double, the man with dropsy, the ten lepers, the deaf and dumb man, the blind man of Bethsaida, Lazarus, the blind men of Jericho, the high priest's servant, and uh, these are the ones that are specifically mentioned. All these wonderful healing miracles. And we know there are many, many, many more that the gospel writers do not record. We have general statements, uh, don't we, about the healing ministry. Let's have a look at Matthew 4, verse 23 to 25. Jesus went around all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sicknesses and all kinds of diseases among the people. Then his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments, and those who were demon-possessed, epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them. Great multitudes followed him from Galilee and from Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond the Jordan. So with these kind of general statements on the healing of Jesus, we, we, we have so many examples there that aren't even mentioned. He's just saying they just healed everybody. He, statements in the Gospels you find, he's, he's just, they're all healed. doesn't tell you what they're healed of, but all, all kinds of diseases. How many were healed? They were all healed. What kind of diseases? All, all kinds of diseases. And I've been on healing missions and, and ministries where God has blessed us with that anointing where everybody's been healed in certain meetings and situations. Not like great crowds with everybody healed, you know, I don't want to exaggerate it, but in, in groups and places where everybody was healed. And you came back, I remember one night when everybody was healed, I think there's one exception to this, one young boy who was a deaf boy in a, in, in a baby in the in mother's arms, and we, I don't think that child was healed, we, I didn't see evidence of it. The child may have been healed later or may have been healed at that time, but I just didn't see evidence of it. I just sensed there was something blocking, there was something there that I just couldn't get a hold of. But that was the, possibly the one exception. And it was like the whole of the night, the people wouldn't go home. We were staying in a mud house. They wouldn't go home. 
And the anointing of healing was so strong. As we were eating, they were crowding at the door. They were coming to the door, just like the Gospels. And so I said, you go, you go this time. So the one person on the team went and came back and said, that was a deaf person healed. Hallelujah, praise God. Then there was somebody else. You go this time. Everybody was healed. What, so we came back to London and we said, what a great time. What happened? Wonderful things happened. Many healings? Yes. How many? Everyone. What were they healed of? Everything. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm talking about specific contexts now. I'm not talking about that's the description of my whole ministry out there. You know that. But uh, what I'm saying is that we don't have all the examples specifically mentioned in the Gospels of the healings of Jesus in his day. And then we see the general principles that seem to govern this healing mission of Jesus. And again, it's covered in, in the other manuals. It's covered in uh, ministry in the Spirit in particular. So I won't go into too much detail now. But we find him healing ordinary people. He went out to the social outcasts. He went out to people who were ordinary. He, he, he was looking for people, ordinary people, the hurting, the common people. He healed serious diseases. He healed on the streets. He didn't just conduct a healing service in a kind of formal way. He, were, he healed as he went on the way. He responded to people as they came to him with need, and he responded to the Spirit. What else was it that took Jesus into that pool in Bethesda to heal that sick man who had been there paralyzed for 38 years? The man couldn't come to Jesus. Jesus went to the man. Why? He says later on in John chapter 5, the son can do nothing except that he sees the father do it. The spirit led him there. He ministered with commands. He said, be healed. He touched people, laid hands on people. And he, his healing ministry impressed people. He also involved other people in his mission. So he's, he's, he, he's delivering, he's healing, and now also he is proclaiming. The Son proclaims the kingdom of God. He begins his mission by proclaiming that the kingdom of God has come and then demonstrates the arrival of the kingdom through the miraculous activity of healing and delivering. But he also said the kingdom is yet still to come and told us that there was coming a time when God's kingdom would be fully manifested on the earth. In his teaching, the Son shows that the kingdom belongs to God. It's dynamic, it's powerful, it's established personally by the Son, and it means salvation. In his parables, he teaches that the kingdom will grow, that the kingdom is hidden, it's an invisible kingdom that the kingdom is precious, that it's a mystery, that it touches the nations of the world, that it demands repentance and obedience, that the kingdom is important, it has priority, that the kingdom will be opposed and resisted. And it calls people to respond to this message by repenting and believing. The time has come, he says, the age of God's personal rule has come, and you are called to make a radical personal choice, a response, to God's presence and rule. And this will mean that you will surrender your own rule and submit to the rule of God. You must repent and believe. The word repent is a word that means fundamentally change your mind. And it suggests that the Son's proclamation must bring a radical transformation of thought, of attitude and outlook, and then ultimately, direction of your life. It's a mental revolution which then leads to a radical turnabout of life. We must change our mind about sin, change our mind about God, and we must repent and walk in obedience with obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, here we have God in Christ telling us we are to follow him and be part of his kingdom. He pronounces that the kingdom produces, must produce discipleships. God's rule produces a disciple, and discipleship is part of that. That this is an urgent call, the call to discipleship. We must follow him. They left everything to follow him. And this discipleship is an absolute call. We forsake all to become his disciple. Therefore, it's costly. He describes this in his teaching 
as he proclaims the kingdom of God. We also see, too, that there is a progression in this message. First of all, he calls people to change the way they think about God. Next, he calls them to believe in him and to rely on him and trust in him completely. And then he calls them to follow him closely, paying the full price to become his disciple. But this is not the end. We're not only called to follow the Son, we're called also to be like him. And his mission was not just to collect a band of converts and to make disciples, it's also to transform these into his personal likeness. And there are five important ways that the gospel shows us that we are to be like him. We're to love like him, to give like him, to serve like him, to work like him, and to go like him. Now in this we see, therefore, how important it is to grasp the multifaceted mission of Jesus correctly. To understand its uniqueness, yes, but also to see that it is a multifaceted mission. That's why we should grasp the importance of going and doing what Jesus has called us to do. He's calling us to share with him in this unique mission, to pass on this message of reconciliation, to apply his victory over evil, to glorify the living God, to heal the sick, to preach the good news of the kingdom to the hurting people around us. So this mission is a model for our mission. It's unique to Jesus because he is the unique son of God, but it is also imparted to us that we in his name might go and do the things that he's called us to do. Well, what a unique and wonderful Savior we have. That's his unique mission. And I, for one, I know you join with me in this. Otherwise, you wouldn't be watching this or you wouldn't be here today. You want the ministry of Jesus in your life. God grant it to you, and he will if you seek him in Jesus' name. God bless you. We'll be back for the next session. And that brings to an end today's teaching on knowing the Son. And I pray that throughout these programs, God will give you greater and greater revelation concerning Jesus Christ, the Son of God. We'll be back next time with more teaching on knowing the Son. Mm -hmm.